Hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. So in this video, we're going to look into the thermal properties of matter. So in the past last video, we learned about the characteristics of matter in three different states, solid, liquid, and gas. So in this video, we're going to focus on what happens to the three states when they're being heated. And all substances, solid, liquid, and gases, they expand when temperature um, rises. And this is called thermal expansion. We're going to look into several examples of um, thermal expansion in solid, liquid, and gas. And let's start off with solid. Here I have a stubborn metal lid or cap. We all have this scenario which we cannot open the cap. And heating it will help us to open it because heating the lid will cause it to expand. And the glass will expand much less than the metal lid, which will create a space. And this lid will then loosen and can be removed. And the second example of thermal expansion in solid is the bimetallic strip. It is the metal strip that is built of two different uh, materials. And one material is going to bend more than the others. So what happened here is that when the strip is heated, the metal expands, causing the strip to bend. And they are used in thermostats like that or, fire, or even fire alarms. And the third types of um, application it will be the metal bridges because metal bridges and railway lines often expand on hot days, so there's a danger that they might expand. And therefore, the bridge developers, they sort of put this kind of um, the expansion joint between each bridge section. And therefore, on a hot day, the bridge is going to expand, let's say in this way, the gap between sections the, will the bridge will expand and the gaps between each section is going to be decreased. So in other words, this makes the bridge to be more flexible and this removes the risk of them being bent and you know the car cannot travel over them anymore. So that's about it for the expansion of solid. And as for liquid, many monitors use this expansion of liquid to measure the temperature because as the temperature rises, the liquid also rises giving us an indicator of what temperature it is in the surrounding. And that's simple, whereas the expansion of gas is a little bit different. Um, they are going to change the size of the container when they are being heated. And at first, the gas is cold and its particles press weakly against the piston. But then as the gas is heated up, it slowly expands because the air particles is, is pushing the piston up. So this is how gas expand when they are being heated. So if you compare the order of expansion for three states of matter, gas is going to expand the most because the gas particles are very loosely apart. And solid is going to expand the least because it's difficult for particles of solid to push their neighbor aside because there's strong attractive force among them. All right, just a side note here, when the material expands, its particles do not get any bigger and however, they can move around more and take up more space. And that's, this is how thermal expansion actually causes the volume of something to increase. It's not the particle here that increase in size, it's the space they take. And let's look into the second subtopic called specific heat capacity. Before I understand what this term means, you first need to understand that all objects, solid, liquid, and gas, they have something called internal energy. Internet energy basically consists of kinetic energy of the particles, let's say in the gas, and also the chemical potential energy, which is the chemical bond that sort of make these particles group together. All right, so these are the energy that a substance will store. They are supplying thermal energy to an object like that, either solid, liquid, and gas, is going to raise its temperature. And that's because particles will move faster when they're being heated and they will as they gain more kinetic energy. So it is important to, for us to understand how much energy in exact do I need to supply to a substance to increase temperature by one degree Celsius. So here I have one kilogram of water and it's at 27 degrees Celsius. So question for scientists to answer is how much energy in exact do I need to increase the temperature of this liquid from 27 to 28? And the answer here is 4,200 Joule. So that's the amount of energy you need to increase one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And that's 
the definition of specific capacity. Another way we can say the fo the following term is that the specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 Joule per kilogram per degree Celsius. So let's look into the formal definition of specific heat capacity. The energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of the substance by one degree Celsius. And do take note that every liquid or matter or gas out there, they are going to have different specific heat capacity, meaning they heat up differently. So there's a formula relating energy, mass, specific heat capacity, and temperature change, which is E equal to MC theta. And let's try to use this in the question to help you understand. Okay, before that, do note that different objects have different specific heat capacity. Um, it still has way, has 10 times less specific capacity as compared to water. This means that it requires fewer energy, less energy, to heat this up as compared to heating water up. That's why when you heat steel, it can get hot pretty easily because it has low specific heat capacity. And the specific capacity of water is high compared to other materials. It means that it's very hard to heat up water. And it is also very hard. It will take a long time to make it cool down because they have high specific heat capacity. And if you go to the beaches, you know that the land is going to heat up faster than the, than the sea water because the land here has low specific heat capacity. Therefore, the sand will get hot very quickly as compared to water here and you know the sea water. So let's solve some questions using the formulas that we have mentioned just now. A kettle heats 1.5 kilogram of water. The question is, how much energy is needed to raise the temperature of the water from 20 to 100 degrees Celsius, assuming that specific heat capacity is 4,200. So we're going to use the formula E equal to MC delta. Delta means temperature change, temperature change. And the energy is what we want to calculate. I just put 1.5 into my formulas specific heat capacity 4200 and followed by temperature change 80. So if I were to put everything into my calculator, I would have gotten 504,000 joule. So this is the amount of energy I need to heat up 1.5 kilogram of water from this degree Celsius to this temperature. All right, so let's look into another form, uh, another question. Now, an electric kettle has a power of 2,000 watts. 2,000 watts stands for 2,000 joule per second. This is the amount of energy they can exert in one second. The question said it takes 90 seconds to heat up 500 grams of an unknown liquid from 20 degrees Celsius to boiling. Using boiling point is 100. All right, using this information to calculate an approximate value for specific heat capacity. So I can use the same formulas, but now my subject is C because I need to calculate the specific heat capacity. I'm going to make C the subject and move M and the temperature change to the other side of the equation. So the energy supplied here is not mentioned, but we do know that the electric kettle has power of 2000 watts. If this kettle opens for 90 seconds, we know that the energy supply will be equal to 2000 multiplied by 90 divided by the mass, which is 1.5, oh, which is 0 0.5 multiplied by 80, which is the temperature change. Again, if I were to put everything into my formulas, uh, into my calculator, so this will be the result I get. I let 180. 90, I first calculate the energy supplied and plug everything into the equation, make C the subject, and I would have gotten C equal to 4,500 joule per kg per degree Celsius. And the unit here is special, but you don't need to memorize it, honestly. Just know that joule, this means I need 4,500 joule to heat up one kg of that particular liquid by one degree Celsius. So that's how I basically remember the unit. Great, so now we have learned about how 
what happened to liquid when they heat up and how much energy to it should be used to heat up you know a certain liquid now we're going to look into this another topic of thermal called changing states like changing state could be from solid to liquid or vice versa or liquid into gas and vice versa so if i were to look here this graph shows that the temperature of a certain object as they are being heated and at first let's look into it so part a so that's basically what happened in to the ice in the freezer what the temperature uh, the ice is at the temperature well below its freezing point which is less than zero per degree celsius and let's say if i were to turn off the electricity for the fridge they're going to start heating up but they will still be less than zero and until this point which the temperature of the ice becomes zero you can see that they sort of the increase in temperature takes a pause the ice stays at zero degrees celsius as it melts because it's melting but degree celsius of the ice is still going to be zero and once it has completely melted the water temperature start to rise again all the way till 100 degrees celsius let's say you heat them up with fire and at 100 degrees celsius the boiling point of water the temperature once again remains steady so this is the phase which liquid is starting to change to gas and the water is boiling to form steam and you can see that for both part b all right so continue e if you continue to heat up the steam the temperature of the steam will rise again but the question we want to ask ourselves is that why is it that in part b and part d of the graph the temperature stays the same even though time has passed and there are two main reasons the first reason is because energy is needed to break bonds and change a substance for instance from solid to liquid remember solid is held together by very strong attractive force and therefore in order to break these forces energy is supplied and that energy will not be used to increase the temperature of the substance. The second thing, as well as I said, is because you need to overcome the attraction of particles when um, liquid is changed to gas. Great. So the first thing is when solid to change to liquid, we use the word break bonds. And when liquid is changed to gas, we say that energy is used to overcome the attraction of particles. So if this process are reversed instead, energy will be given out so in the previous example we supply energy so that liquid can be changed to gas but when gas condenses into liquid energy is liquid uh, energy is given out same goes to when liquid is solidified into gas uh, into solid so for two there are two important terms that we're going to mention again melting point it is the temperature at which solid melts and boiling point is when liquid changes to gas and when you dissolve things into water, it will change the boiling point and freezing point of the water. For example, salt water boils at higher temperature than pure water and freezes at a lower temperature. So that's what happens when you add something into a particular substance. So let's look into another form of um, changing of state. So previously we learned about boiling. Now we learn about evaporation. So liquid can also change state without boiling. This process is called evaporation. And using the kinetic panic, we will use the kinetic molecule model of method to explain evaporation. So imagine that these are the particles in liquid. So the particles on the surface, water surface are sort of moving around and some will be moving faster than the others. And it will move fast enough once to escape from the water from from the beaker here and then these particles will become liquid and will become gas particles in the air all right and that's how evaporation happens so if you were to put a cup of water in the balcony and a week later you will have found out that it has evaporated so all these water particles has left the surface so um one quick general knowledge how does evaporation cools our body um, we know that as we're sweating, um, we, we'll get, or when we're in rain after swimming, if we, we get wet, we'll get cold very easily. That's because particles that are of high kinetic energy, so let's say you were 
um, you just came out from swimming pool, you have water. So as they evaporate, um, this kind of kinetic energy um, will cause evaporation, and those that remain will have less energy. And now the particles of liquid will have less energy, and so the temperature of the water decreases, which cause the body temperature to decrease. So here are a few differences between boiling and evaporation. Evaporation will happen at all temperatures, although the higher the temperature, the faster the evaporation will happen. Whereas boiling can only happen at the boiling point of the substance. Evaporation happens when most energetic particles escape. So evaporation takes energy from the substance. And boiling happens when liquid has to be when liquid is boiled and the kinetic energy of the particles must also increase for boiling to happen. Evaporation only happens at the surface like this of at the water surface, whereas boiling happens throughout the liquid. And a liquid can evaporate without bubbles, and boiling will certainly create liquid bubbles. So let's look into some of um, what are some of the factors affecting the speed of evaporation. First thing is that the hotter the temperature, the faster um, the evaporation rate. And that makes sense in terms of kinetic model, model of particles because as you increase the temperature, you are going to increase the kinetic particles of gas, which they will move faster and therefore they will also escape from the water surface a lot quicker. So first factor, increasing the temperature increase the increases the evaporation rate. Second part is to increase the surface area. Again, looking at this diagram here, the second beaker will have the water in the second beaker will have higher evaporation rate because more water particles are being exposed to the surface. So that's second um, factor. The third factor is when whether you have blowing air across the surface, and we know that evaporation happens because water particles escape. And therefore, if you were to have moving air, there, these water particles are going to get blown away. In other words, they sort of leave the water surface at a faster rate, which result in better evaporation rate. So the last slide of the video, why would the evaporation of sweat cool us down? That's because as liquid evaporates, the remaining liquid cools. This means thermal energy will flow to the liquid from any object in contact to it. And when we got hot, we sweat, and the sweat evaporates, causes thermal energy to flow from the skin, which means the thermal energy from our body basically leave our body, which help us to cool down. And that's also why we sweat when we are playing um, high intensity activities. So that's all about it for this chapter. We study how the different states of matter um, react when they are being heated. We also learn about the difference between evaporation and boiling, and also the, what are the factors that affect the evaporation rate. And that's about it for this video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.